Industries. Uh, today, I will, we're going to walk through um, our biomedical, uh, yeah, our rapid biomedical knowledge base construction from unstructured data. So just to give an outline of the day's agenda, we're going to discuss in more depth this sort of idea of how we design labeling functions. We'll talk about certain classes or categories of labeling functions that we have commonly encountered while building applications in text. And then we'll show you sort of the metrics and ways that we formally evaluate how well they perform to assist us in the development process. Then we'll move to the generative model, which is the unifying supervision portion of uh, the snorkel pipeline. We'll sort of talk a little bit about, um, again, what Alex gave you a preview about this morning, how the process of learning LF accuracies, labeling function accuracies proceeds, and a little bit of how we learn the dependency structure amongst labeling functions. We won't get very technical. Um, uh, there's certainly a lot of technical stuff we could talk about. Usually that works a little better in offline one-on-one -on -one settings, so don't hesitate to flag down Alex or me or anybody um, else like Proma who will be here later who's done a lot of work on that side. And then finally we'll show you the discriminative model that's the you know insert your favorite deep learning model here um, which you can view as sort of compiling your labeling functions into features so that they you know your final in model generalizes beyond the rules used to train it and um, We'll talk a little bit about how we do that and, of course, walk through in the notebook. And then we'll wrap it up in the day with a welcome reception. All right, so I'll open up with a little terminology. Um, I'm, uh, I assume most of you guys are familiar with this, but we'll get everyone on the same page. We commonly talk about entities. That's just a, uh, in text, is a conceptual concept, which is just some subsequence of text. That might be a person's name, might be a geographic location or organization. It's just a sort of tight conceptual category. In the bio space, I will say, sometimes those categories aren't quite as clear or clearly delineated as you'd hope in sort of these more um, sort of general categories. So that can be sometimes a, um, require some thought to properly set, define what an entity is for your problem. A relation is just simply some two or more uh, connection between entities that has some semantically meaningful uh, element. For instance, if we took two people names, you could imagine a relation being defined over them as spouse or are they married. And we'll actually, the spouse example will be our motivating example on all of our slides that we proceed through today. And then finally, as Alex had said earlier, sort of the, you know, one of the end artifacts that can come out of these dark data systems or what's extracting systems that extract stuff out of text is like a knowledge base that can either be a database of some structured elements, it can be a graph, it's just a general way to represent knowledge in a structured form. Okay, so I'm going to sort of set the stage and ask you guys to imagine that you were all you know, well sought after data scientist in TMZ, the celebrity gossip website has approached you to build a state of the art text mining system to extract celebrity marriage gossip. And you, not wanting to necessarily spin this up on Amazon Turk, you realize that this is a very nice use case of relation extraction and you would like to use Snorkel to tackle this problem more quickly and collect your TMZ paycheck. Um, so how would we do this? You would need to be able to build a knowledge base of married couples by extracting mentions of spouses or pairs of people from newswire text. That would just be articles that show up online. These are just a few examples of real news article text that um, we've tagged people names in, and these would be potential sentences or potential pairs of entities that may or may not be married. So as Alex said earlier, the sort of conventional standard approach to this problem would be to say, hey, I need to build my training set, so I'm going to, through crowdsourcing or through you know, domain experts, I guess pull people who track celebrity stuff, and have them label a bunch of data for you. Then you would go and manually define a bunch of features, and then you would train some in model to extract this information. These, is, again, has been stated, are non-trivial uh, non engineering efforts. And really, deep learning has largely, to some extent, removed the need to really think 
a lot about manual feature engineering. It's made that process considerably easier in some settings. But we still need to label a bunch of data. And what that looks like, again, is looking at sentences and just deciding, you know, the first example is a true case, the second example is a negative case, and repeating this hundreds or thousands of times, depending on the complexity of your task. So the snorkel data programming approach is to just approach this by writing labeling functions. And that's to take some heuristic or insight that you would use as a human and encode that and wrap it up in a function so that you can apply it to the data in some potentially noisy way. And then we let um, you take this collection of labeling functions and we combine and unify them in all the fancy ways Alex outlined to you know, model their accuracies and such to arrive at a single probabilistic label per training point. So the next sort of step is you know, how do we intuitively think about encoding our common sense world knowledge or domain expertise into functions so that we can apply it to a problem. So we'll start with a, an example. If I gave this to you and asked you to you know, decide what the label is and tell me what evidence you use to make that decision, what would you guys find in this example? Is it true or false? I guess start there. Mm -hmm. True, right? And how do we know that? Yeah, right, exactly. And that, and that occurred, right? Another key is that it occurs between the people's names, right? So that's a pretty strong indicator. And you could also think maybe there aren't a lot of words in between the people's names. So there's sort of, that's another clue that potentially these people are in fact truly married. So that's one heuristic. You've written a very simple labeling function just right there. Look for the word husband or wife occurring between dimensions of two people's names. How about this example? Yep. <laughs> yeah, well, so that's, that's interesting, right? So like, you know, we have a couple sort of, this is where we start needing some sort of notion of knowledge about how the world works, right? You could think of first lady between a name is probably a good, it's a weird, rare mention or synonym for a spouse of some sort. You could also think that, you know, with U.S. president, those are strongly linked. That's how you commonly refer to the, you know, couple in the White House. Um, but yeah, but those are all clues you could imagine, you know, covering by writing in some sort of labeling function. And that's really the insight, is you guys came up very quickly with a couple heuristics that you could imagine writing in some Python or other programming language form. That would then, if you were presented with a pair of a pair of people names in a document or a sentence, you could make a vote in some reasonably informed way. That's um, you know noisy perhaps, but you know better than certainly, but far better than random chance. So this is the idea of a labeling function for the space of all of the discussion today and the examples we'll look at in our Jupyter notebooks. We assume binary classification. That's you're presented with a potential, uh, what should we call candidate or entity to, you know, relation to classify. And you'll either vote that it's true or, you know, positive or negative, or this special case for labeling functions, abstain, which is just saying I decline to vote. And basically that is the output space for a labeling function, um, which boils down to one, negative one, and zero just as a return value. Yep? Can you give us an example for when you vote by abstaining? Like, why would you do that? Yeah, I think that we'll get to an actual like, walkthrough example. But basically, the intuition for abstain is if you, th you, know, you don't necessarily have the confidence to vote one way or the other, or sometimes it's more elegant to express a bit of information, right? So if I gave you a knowledge base of chemical and disease relationships, which in fact, we'll give you later today, you know, if a pair of chemicals and diseases shows up in that database, you could say that's a true, that's a good noisy signal that those two entities are related in some way. But if that is not in the database, the absence of a pair doesn't really tell you it's negative, right? So in that case, it would probably be better to abstain rather than vote negative, right? Because that's just more reflects the knowledge in the labeling function you're writing.
Okay, that's a great question. Okay, so this gets to the idea of candidates. Um, there's a few terms of art that are pretty simple. We'll just get everyone on the same page. Basically, a candidate is a data instance that a, we will be training and running our predictive model over, right? I give you, in this case, it's a pair of people names found inside a sentence that's already been prepackaged and generated for a large collection of documents. Each one of these pairs is a candidate and it's something that a labeling function will vote on, something you will use to train your discriminative model and in our held out test set, what you run your classification model on to do predictions, right? So this is sort of our level of, 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 of predictive units. We want to write a collection of labeling functions that vote both true and false. They cover both the negative cases and the positive cases, right? So in this sentence, as you guys pointed out earlier, his wife, that's a strong clue that these two you know, people names are in fact reflect a, a true spouse relation. While, you know, Khloe Kardashian says she's definitely down to down to marry, blah, 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 blah. Um, this would indicate that in this case, it's not a true marriage relation. And you need to capture both sides of the coin when writing labeling functions, right? Both positive and negative supervision. And your just general goal is to provide, you know, potentially weak correlated signal with the true class labels, right? You could think of this as, you know, layering some notion of a prior over your feature space, but generally it's some finding some collection of correlated bits of information that you can inject into the model using labeling functions, again, to provide both positive and negative supervision. What are some other sort of intuitions we could apply in the spouse example? For, po you know, for the positive case, we might say, well, if we have two people entity names and they share the last, same last name, that could be a, you know, a positive labeling function. That's gonna have some noise, right? Because you know, siblings and family members will share the same name, but that's fine in Snorkel, right? We can use this sort of noisy supervision, even if it only captures part of the space of what we're labeling. You could think of a negative supervision where, well, if boyfriend or girlfriend shows up between people names, that's a good clue that these, you know, in, in fact, not a spouse relationship. And so that would be two positive negative style labeling functions you could write for this task. And then, you know, that's the big level intuition that just gets translated down into code. And then that's just sort of standard Python stuff. I would ignore this. We'll actually do in a, in a Jupyter Notebook. We'll look at a little more detail in the Snorkel API, so how you interact with candidate objects. But the key takeaway is these are not crazy complex things, right? They're, you know, they, they certainly, they could be. Nothing prevents you from writing, uh, you know, these are just black box functions. You could write an arbitrarily complicated labeling function. You could wrap up a complicated, you know, trained model, trained on an entirely different setting. But generally it's just, you know, a lot of things can be expressed in sort of compact, sort of short labeling functions for some space of stuff in text. And again, the critical thing when thinking about labeling functions is these can be noisy, right? So it's better, I would say, it's, it's a valid strategy not to fret so much at your first pass that there are going to be errors, right? You just want to flexibly sort of express information, right? So in this case, you know, we, you know, if we use the same last name, we got it with the Obamas, but with the Olsen twins, we in fact get that wrong. And then, you know, in celebrities or people that keep their same last name, we in fact, we, you know, abstain perhaps, so we didn't catch it. So there are a bunch of definite corner cases where this labeling function doesn't hit anything, but that's fine. Yeah. Do we develop the labeling functions within the training set? Say that again, sorry. Do we develop the labeling functions within the training set because they may apply well for you know, the, the text we, when we actually have, but then we try, when we try to deploy the text that we don't actually have? Yeah, that's a great question. So you do, um, you tend to explore your data, right? So you explore your training set or a held out dev set, and you do write labeling functions that could cover that space. 
But if you lift those labeling functions and apply them to a different training set that was perhaps generated in a different way or has slightly different st statistics, the labeling functions will, will have different statistics as well. In practice, depending on the domain, so I do have like practical experience like pulling labeling functions up from one set of patient clinical notes in EHR and putting them into another set, they actually do transfer fairly nicely depending on your task. But the solution really is to draw another sample and either add more labeling functions or tweak them appropriately. Um, and that's sort of one very nice thing about this is that it's very flexible, right? That's not an intractable task to do that. It's a great question. Okay. All right, so we'll outline a few design strategies. How am I doing on time, Joy? Am I good? Okay, okay, great. Um, right, so uh, previously we had sort of focused on using some common sense patterns or keywords to label a person as married or not, right? Does this word appear between a pair of names? All that kind of jazz, right? So this is mostly what I would call or we would call pattern-based labeling functions. This would be like um, someone mentioned using regular expressions to match different types of entities that would fall under the same umbrella, that you can capture a lot of information by specifying some set of pattern matchers, right? Those can all be wrapped up as labeling functions, reused for as a, you know, a source of supervision that we model noise over. But there are other resources we can imagine using as labeling functions, right? Um, yeah, so this basically just says the exact same thing. We're just using string matching or regular expressions to find this. But as Alex had mentioned earlier today, another sort of commonly used sort of paradigm in this is something called distance supervision. So can I, who has heard that term before? Just a couple of people? Okay. So it's a fairly, you know, uh, it's a very reasonable and pretty older concept. Um, it says that, you know, if I have a database, so let's say, as in the workshop example we'll look at in a little bit, if I wanted to find chemically induced diseases, let's say I have, you know, in my back pocket, this giant hand curated database of known chemically induced diseases where it's represented as a chemical and a disease name. That information you could think of as a noisy supervision source, right? Where I just take it and you could think of it as just, again, one labeling function and I just walk through every sentence, and when those two things show up together, I say that's a true case, right? And then I do some hand-wavy heuristics to define negative cases, because again, you need both positive and negative supervision, and then I just train my model that way. And in fact, that turned to be an effective strategy to increase your training data and train with noisy data sets. Um, so it's, if you have that type of resource ready, it's a very compelling sort of thing to draw on when writing your labeling functions. Just to give, again, walk through, again, a, a concrete example. Let's say we have a labeling function that's named known spouse, right? And I am presented with a sentence of the Obamas, and I have my, a knowledge base, like say Freebase or some of the other you know, big ones that have existed at certain points. I check that knowledge base and see if those two people show up together, and if they do, I label true, and if I don't, I abstain. And there are tons of knowledge bases. So that's what's nice if, um, for all of us who don't work for TMZ and do all this stuff, there are tons of biomedical uh, ontologies and resources that we can draw on to potentially wrap up as distant supervision resources. And today we'll actually, when we dive into the notebooks, we'll look at this um, comparative toxigenomics database, CTD, which is in f just as I described, a database of chemical induced disease names. And we've packaged that up. Again, there's usually some unpleasantness associated with interfacing with these databases sometimes, but that's usually just you know a couple days of grinding away to you know, clean things up and then put it in a nice format that can be used with Snorkel. All right, so um, how do we evaluate labeling functions? Uh, we've come up with a few scoring metrics that give you sort of an intuition of how well your labeling functions are doing. Basically, we've broken it down into these three categories. There's accuracy, that's the percentage of candidates uh, labeling function correctly labels, 
This assumes you have a held out set that you can estimate empirical accuracy over. Of course, um, we, you know, we learn labeling function accuracy as a function of the generative model, but it's often convenient to have a small held out labeled set so that you can get some spot checking sanity checks. We can also do coverage and conflict, which we don't need labels to be able to compute. And that just looks at the given a number of candidates, how do labeling functions vote or fire on top of these candidates? Do they tend to you know, cover 10% of all possible candidates in your training set? Do they tend to conflict to some degree? Um, and these are all sort of metrics that give you sanity checks on uh, you know, how your labeling functions are interacting with your unlabeled data. And again, it's very convenient to, if you have, this is not unreasonable, to have a very small set of hand-labeled data that you can use for development purposes. Again, as Alex pointed out, that's frequently orders of magnitude smaller than what you realistically need to train a high-performance model. And sort of in a, you know, best of all possible worlds, we'd love high coverage, high accuracy labeling functions. Usually, unfortunately, that means if you can write those, your problem is probably too easy to actually use machine learning for. Um, so what you often do is um, you want sort of a mix of, you know, noisy, potentially larger coverage ones, and then smaller, high precision ones that label some, you know, part of your crazy high dimensional, you know, feature space. And the only real constraint, I would say, on LFs is that they should label with probability better than random chance. And this is um, an assumption that sort of makes everything work in terms of the generative model. But in fact, what you find is it's, that's not a very st strong thing to assume. In fact, people tend to write labeling functions that do better than random chance more often than not. And usually it's a few outliers that, again, may have bugs or may just be wrong, and you can catch those as you do this sort of iterative development cycle. And then, of course, at the end of the things, we evaluate using standard information retrieval metrics like precision, which is just true positives over true positives and false positives. Recall, which is true positives over the set of every possible true instance we could find in our data. And then an F-score, which is just the unweighted harmonic mean of precision and recall. You can use whatever metrics you want. These are the ones we use for convenience sake. Um, it's often a problem specific, what you want to really focus in on. Um, but these are standard for all these text-based applications. And as Joy hinted at this morning, we are you know, putting a little uh, uh, fire into your guys' motivations. Uh, we will be having two basic competitions. On day one, we'll be looking at PubMed abstracts, where we're having you write labeling functions to extract chemically induced diseases. And that's what we'll focus on today. And at the end of, uh, we won't know, you have to, you know, hold your excitement for the day so that I can run everyone's pipeline into in this afternoon or this evening, but tomorrow we'll know Whomever does the best on the discriminative model, so we'll let the AWS instances you know, churn away all night, training um, a bunch of deep learning models, will give first, second, and third prizes of $15, $25, and $50. Tomorrow, we will show you guys, uh, I don't know if you, I think you all, everyone's done the DUA for Mimic, but we'll look at patient clinical notes, which are a completely different beast than PubMed. They're super noisy, they have weirdo, vocabulary, we don't have, you know, really nice distance supervision databases, so it's sort of a different flavor of weekly supervising data. That's, I've spent a lot of time myself writing applications in clinical text. Um, again, we'll do the same prize hierarchy and then let you guys know um, uh, uh, a little after, later after we, you guys take off. Um, but the reason we're doing this is because if you look in your Jupyter Notebook folder, you'll see a notebook that has an IRB disclosure is that we will be collecting all of your labeling functions and doing some experiments to see how we can combine them together and learn some dependency structure to sort of explore some questions about, you know, sort of a new way to think about crowdsourcing. Can we do things through labeling functions instead of just manually labeling points? We had some preliminary uh, evidence that suggested uh, it's possible to do better than any single individual and come super close to hand-labeled data in a very, very short amount of time. Um, 
So that's sort of what we're testing out now in two actual real biomedical settings. Um, so if you guys don't feel comfortable with that, uh, you can um, certainly opt out. Nothing is identifying with you. Um, so, uh, but don't hesitate to talk to me or Joy or somebody if that is a problem.